and welcome to Chicago tonight. I'm Brian in our northwest side. And I'm Paris Schutz reporting live from the south side communities of Roseland and Pullman. On the show tonight, Senator Dick Durbin on the next stimulus plan. What happens if you need a marriage certificate during a pandemic? A local cleaning company shows us how it disinfects COVID-19 contaminated areas. Rick Bayless talks about how the restaurant industry is faring and visiting an art collection designed to move the spirit. First, Brandis, as we mentioned earlier, I'm co-anchoring tonight from historic Pullman on the city's south side. We spent the day reporting here and in neighboring Roseland, two communities that have been hit not only by the health impacts of the coronavirus and the pandemic and the shutdown, but also the economic impacts as well. So we'll have all the very latest from here in just a bit. But first, we throw it back to you for the latest developments. Paris, thank you. Illinois health officials report a record number of new coronavirus cases with more than 4,000 confirmed since yesterday. says that the state ramped up testing capacity. If you don't test and you should look at some of the other large states that aren't testing as much as we are, then guess what? You have fewer cases reported. So the fact that we were able to report that we reported 4,000 cases today is a function of the fact that we did 29,000 tests. State health officials also announced an additional 144 deaths since yesterday, bringing the total number of coronavirus deaths in the state to 3,601. And more than 83,000 COVID-19 cases have now been confirmed in Illinois. The nation's top infectious disease doctor warns that states reopening too early face, quote, suffering and death that could be avoided. Dr. Anthony Fauci testified at a virtual U.S. Senate committee hearing, telling senators that ignoring federal guidelines on when it's safe for states to reopen could also delay an economic rebound. I feel if that occurs, there is a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak that you may not be able to control, which in fact paradoxically will set you back, not only leading to some suffering and death that could be avoided, but could even set you back on the road to trying to get economic recovery. The national death toll that currently stands at almost 82,000 likely counts the number of coronavirus. And in just a few moments, Phil Ponce talks with Illinois Senator Dick Durbin about Fauci's testimony. The companies that help restaurants deliver carryout orders have some new rules to follow. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says companies like Grubhub and Uber Eats must now disclose service fees paid to them by the restaurants. The issue blew up on social media when Chicago pizza boss Giovanni Barlamenti shared a statement from Grubhub for a restaurant he was doing consulting for. It showed the restaurant received less than $400 on orders after Grubhub's fees were deducted. The new rules take effect next Friday. Now, there's more on our, that story on our website. Plus, we'll hear from Chicago chef Rick Bayless about the fate of the restaurant industry later in the program. Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart is challenging a federal court order that details how his office must combat the COVID-19 outbreak in Cook County Jail. Dart's office says he plans to appeal that injunction brought on by a lawsuit from attorneys representing two medically vulnerable detainees in the jail. The sheriff says his office has already been in compliance with CDC and public health guidelines and that the additional legal wrangling is a, quote, tremendous waste of resources. As of Monday, seven detainees and three Cook County Sheriff's Office employees have died after contracting COVID-19, while the total number of cases there approaches 1,000. The COVID-19 pandemic and shutdown has hit hard in Chicago communities that historically have suffered from disinvestment and crime. Paris Schutz and producer Quinn Myers spent the day in far south side communities of Roseland and Pullman to get a sense of how residents are surviving. Roseland is predominantly African-American and low income, and Pullman is the former factory community designated as a National Historic Monument. Paris joins us now in that landmark district off St. Lawrence and 111th Street. Hey, Paris. Hey, Brannis. Yeah, Pullman is famous for that historic district of row houses that used to house workers at the old Pullman Porter plant, which is still standing right behind me. And then just to our west is the sister community of Roseland, which has suffered from disinvestment and the loss of industry over the last several decades. There are murals and monuments to the labor rights movement everywhere in this community. 
and both communities sit in a zip code that has seen 788 positive COVID-19 cases. That's moderately high compared to some of the other Chicago neighborhoods we visited. There is a high population of residents in Roseland that suffer from a lot of the underlying illnesses that make COVID so complicated, which is why the community safety net Roseland Hospital was socked with patients in the very first weeks of this pandemic before getting a lot of testing up and running. They say they're about to do 11,000 tests by the end of this week, tests performed. Now, there have been hundreds more residents, though, worried that they're exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. The patients that present to this hospital, Rosen community in particular, have multiple medical issues that are advanced, whether it be end-stage renal disease, heart disease, uh, diabetes, pneumonia. Um, and as a result, you have to consider that when you're admitting these patients. So when the COVID-19 virus occurred, it just made another complexity in terms of treating the patients, but by no means did the patients disappear. So we'd have to admit these patients and undergo multiple testing. And we'll have more on that hospital later in the show. It is a crucial anchor for a community that had been a food and health care desert for a while where many residents are unemployed or low income. Now, the Pullman area has seen progress in recent years with the construction of the new Method Soap Factory, a giant Walmart, and an Amazon distribution center set to come online next fall. We compound the high unemployment in Roseland with historic levels and lay of layoffs and furloughs that we're seeing right now. And the community is doubly feeling the effects. And we met a Roseland resident who was laid off from his job as a sous chef at a lettuce entertainment restaurant. And he says he has frantically tried to access the state's unemployment system with no luck for the last four weeks. Please, you got people out here, they're hurting, they're, they're hungry, they got kids. I have a baby on the way, as you see. We got to take care of our families. And there's no way for us to take care of our families if we can't get have the money to, you know, to be able to do that. Right now, it's really hard. I'm borrowing money from my brothers and my sister and my mom so I could be able to help out, you know, take care of the bills at my house. And community activists have long fought for more local businesses in the neighborhood. One of them, the Ranch Steakhouse, was successful at getting those federal PPP funds, but they say they have not been able to do enough business to stay open and keep their employees working, which means they fear they'll eventually have to pay those funds back. And so you have to pay 75% of that loan to your employees for salaries if it's going to be forgiven. But the restaurant is not going to be open up. Uh, I'm listening to what the governor is saying probably to June 26th. And so that's a problem. Uh, I'm probably going to have to end up having to pay the loan, make it a loan, and not, you know, it's not going to be forgiven. And the Greater Roseland Chamber of Commerce says they've been fighting for many years to landmark all of South Michigan Avenue there so that they can get some landmark funds and some incentives to build more business, save some of the historic buildings. They said there was momentum for that. That all right now has come to a pause. It was considered the um, uh, shopping mecca. It was the um, jewel of the South Side. And so it can be that again. Um, we just have to get some things turned around. So. With the Pullman designation, we're expecting over 300,000 tourists. That, of course, is when Pullman reopens to visitors again. And community service agencies fill so many important gaps as well in Pullman and Roseland. One called the Phalanx Family Services provides job training both to students and adults. Despite the shutdown, the group says it is still operating. It is doing virtual Job, job training programs, still trying to place people in the jobs that exist out there right now. But the bigger problem is a lot of their participants are home and children are home from school, so they can't access those programs right now. Those clients that we work with that were in the process of being prepared for jobs, they can't go, they can't come in. Uh, you know, they can't even work with us virtually because they don't have the equipment they need. So that has really hurt us uh, where there are job vacancies available. There are jobs we're still hiring. We can't necessarily fill them right now because a lot of the parents just don't have child care. So that has really impacted us. And we'll be back with a lot more from Pullman in just a bit. But Brandis, we toss it back to you. Yeah, in Paris, you know, the restaurant industry gets hard hit. You know, they employ so many people. Thank you. And now to Phil Ponce and Illinois Senator U.S. U.S. Senator Dick Durbin. Phil. 
Brandis, today some U.S. Senators grilled Dr. Anthony Fauci at a hearing held via video conferencing technology about reopening the country. So, how soon is too soon, and what might another stimulus bill look like? Joining us now with some insights is Illinois senior U.S. Senator Dick Durbin, who serves in leadership as the Democratic whip. Senator Durbin, thank you so much for joining us. And let's uh, start out with uh, Dr. Fauci's testimony. He testified uh, that if states reopen too quickly, there could be another spike, and that could make things worse. Uh, you are a, on the presidential task force to reopen the economy. What, in your opinion, is needed to go forward safely? What we need is clear evidence that the number of infections are going down, that the trend line is moving in that direction, and that we have adequate health, hospital, and doctor resources to deal with whatever challenge faces us. That's exactly the standard that J.D. Pritzker is using in our state. Now, he's divided the state into different sections, and he's measuring those uh, numbers in each of the sections of the state. I think that's a responsible approach. The Trump White House appears to be trying to turn the corner on the virus pandemic and uh, seems to be focusing more on reopening. Uh, what are your thoughts on that uh, posture that the White House seems to be taking? I, I want to see reopening, but a responsible approach to it. We've spent two months with great sacrifice to families and individuals, to businesses that have closed, to our health heroes who risk their lives every day. It's been a tough uh, slog for us to go through this. I don't want to have to repeat this and do it all over again. Let's get it right. Let's reopen in a responsible way so that we don't face a second peak. Uh, this afternoon, as you know, House Democrats unveiled a new three trillion dollar relief bill with aid to the states and direct payments to Americans. Uh, according to a summary of the measure, it would provide nearly one trillion dollars for state, local and tribal governments. And of that amount, 500 billion would go to states. It also would include a second round of direct payments of twelve hundred dollars per family member and up to six thousand dollars per household. Republicans are blasting the measure as a, quote, liberal wish list. How do you see it? I, I can just tell you that what uh, was proposed by Speaker Pelosi addresses the reality of what we are facing, not only with this health crisis, but with our economy careening at this point. We have to reach the point where we reach out and help individuals and families and small business owners through the, uh, the challenges that they're currently facing and are likely to face in the weeks ahead. I say to my Republican friends, we put about $3 trillion into this effort so far. The proposal by Speaker Pelosi is another $3 trillion. And to my Republican friends, don't get wobbly. Stick with these unemployed Americans. Stick with these small business owners. If we're going to come back strong, as the president wants us to, and we all want to, we need to make sure that we finish this job the right way. And yet there are many Republicans who say they are not interested in supporting another stimulus bill. Uh, do you think there will be another stimulus bill in some form? There definitely has to be. I can just tell you, if my Republican colleagues would go home, as I have, as many do, and talk to the people who are going through this crisis, it isn't over yet by a long shot. They are still wondering if their businesses will ever open again. The unemployed people were reaching record numbers in this country. It's been reported. We know what the challenge is. Stick with these families, stick with these workers, and stick with these small business owners. That's the only way to get through this successfully. Uh, you've said that uh, you're upset about United's job cuts after receiving bailout funds in the last stimulus package. Uh, talk about your concerns should another stimulus uh, package actually come to be. Well, I'm concerned about accountability and oversight. You know, we put the first one together, $2.2 trillion in eight days, an incredible sum of money, more than the entire federal annual domestic discretionary budget. And we put it out the door as we should have. We needed to move quickly, 96 to nothing vote in the United States Senate. But the accountability and oversight was not there. Speaker Pelosi's new approach, and I think it's the right one, calls for accountability almost on a daily basis as to how this money is moving out of the Treasury into the hands of those who need it. The testing strategy on uh, COVID-19 has been pretty much initiated by the states. Should there be a national testing strategy, and could it be bipartisan? There should be a national strategy, and there's more and more people are saying that publicly, as they should in both political parties. We have about one-third of the tests that we currently need to consider seriously reopening this economy. 
We have to reach the point where we can quickly identify the hotspots, where we can do contact tracing, where we can quell any uh, emergence of this infection again. I'm, I'm, I'm heartened today to, to learn that uh, Mayor Lightfoot is uh, opening new testing facilities in the African-American neighborhoods and Hispanic neighborhoods. Desperately needed. We know that for the numbers. But testing is the key to reopening the economy safely. Uh, as you know, Governor Pritzker says that at this point, uh, more reopening uh, down the line may not happen until June. However, uh, other states, some contiguous states, are opening up at a different, uh, uh, quicker. Are you concerned about uh, contig contiguous states that are, uh, that are opening uh, before Illinois is uh, and the apparent inconsistency between those approaches? Each of these states should be viewed individually. Some of them have low incidence of infection and death, and they have the health care facilities they need. They're going to reopen at a different pace than perhaps the Chicagoland area. We're going to learn from their experience, and I hope it's a valuable, positive lesson. I hope that they don't make a big mistake and reopen too soon. We're being careful because we rank fourth in the nation in terms of infections and sixth or seventh in terms of deaths. Uh, we've got to be careful to do this the right way so we don't have to do it a second time. Uh, Wisconsin is uh, reopening at a quicker space than Illinois. Do you expect the Democratic Convention to proceed as scheduled? No. I'm very skeptical that we should gather that uh, number of people from all across the United States under one roof for three or four days of festivities. It's just uh, too dangerous as far as I'm concerned. Let's have a virtual convention. I want people to be healthy and ready to vote in November and not sick. Uh, Senator, you're also on the Judiciary Committee. The Supreme Court heard arguments today in a pair of uh, separation of powers cases in which the president is suing his banks and accountant to try to block them from complying with congressional subpoenas for his financial records. Uh, why is it important, in your opinion, to see his financials? Because every presidential candidate has disclosed their financial uh, records before him. He made a lame excuse about an audit. We don't hear much about that anymore, do we? The fact is, he doesn't want to disclose this information, either because it's embarrassing or conflicts public statements that he's made. I think it's best for disclosure. I disclose my income tax returns and complete returns every year I've been in public office. I think the President of the United States should do the same. Uh, Senator, is there any other point you care to make uh, that you'd like the public to keep in mind as uh, we are still uh, going through this process of uh, dealing with COVID-19? It's tough. It's really difficult on a lot of individuals on a personal basis, a lot of families separated. I won't be around for my new granddaughter's first birthday party, which breaks my heart. But I know what it's all about. I want to make sure that she is safe from this infection and this virus. And we're all facing this. Let's thank those health heroes. We call them health heroes, and they deserve that for risking their lives every day to keep us safe. Senator Dick Durbin, thank you so much for joining us. We very much appreciate it. And up next, how Cook County is handling death certificates and other administrative functions amid the pandemic. But first, a look at the weather. Big wedding blowouts may not be happening, but people are still getting hitched. Amanda Venicky joins us now with a report on how some couples are making it happen. Hey, Amanda. Hey there, Brandis. Yes, like pretty much every other unit of government, the Cook County Clerk's Office is closed due to the coronavirus pandemic and the stay at home order, mostly anyway. Clerk Karen Yarbrough says a socially distancing skeleton crew of about seven to 10 individuals are still going into the office to do things like processing certain documents. Those documents are called vital records, okay? So you have death records, you have marriage records, you have birth records, all of those are vital. New parents, therefore, are still going to be able to get birth certificates for their newborns, Yarbrough says, and the office still processing new death certificates, something that unfortunately we're seeing a whole lot of the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office today reporting 2,551 coronavirus-related deaths in Cook County. As for new marriage certificates, though, that is trickier because in order to get one, couples have to appear together before the clerk's office in person. 
we need to see their documents, back to documents. <laughs> we need to see that they are who they say they are. Um, you know, the world we live in today, um, people sometimes aren't quite who they um, purport to be. And um, we can visually take a look, ask some questions and make sure that this is not a forced situation. But because of COVID-19, those in-person meetings can't and aren't happening. And that has been a problem for some couples, including one that I talked to today. Michelle and Prasad met in 2018 on a backpacking trip in India. He works for a US-based company that does wilderness tours. After their trip, they kept in touch via WhatsApp. They fell in love. Fast forward to this past Valentine's Day when they went on a trip to Spain. So this is the middle of February. This is kind of, you know, people knew that this virus was a thing, but our travel was completely normal. And then um, on my birthday, we got engaged. <laughs> Their plan was to get married this July and then have a big celebration sometime in the fall. But of course, things quickly changed. After that trip to Spain, Michelle came back here. Prasad was in a remote village in India. And that is when the coronavirus was classified as a pandemic. He got on one of the last flights from India to Chicago. But by then, the clerk's office had halted issuing new marriage licenses, with a few exceptions. But what we do is prioritize these marriages to make sure that the dire straits situations are put at the top and we try to facilitate those. Now your situations like a couple perhaps in hospice or an immigration situation that needs legal status, a lot of what is happening now and that is one person loses their job, therefore their health insurance, needs to get married to a partner in order to be on their health care plan. So how is that dealt with? Well, just like this is, virtually. Virtually, we can also see that. I mean, we're doing that right now. You can see I'm not being coerced to do this interview. <laughs> but um, but uh, so, so that's the way we're doing it. Michelle and Prasad had been researching, perhaps getting married in Iowa or Wisconsin, because without people traveling due to COVID-19, Prasad could not get another contract with his company, and so his visa would expire. They wanted to get married so they could get started right away applying for his green card. They applied, and the clerk's office had an employee meet with them via Zoom. He shared his screen. So while we were on the call, he was going through filling out all of the necessary paperwork, basically the same that he would have been doing if we were in person. And so we were able to see and verify everything was spelled correctly, et cetera. And then um, we showed him our IDs. We both had our passports. And through that process, he was able to email us a marriage license. Within days, they made it official. The wedding wasn't exactly as they had imagined. Prasad's parents weren't able to be there in real life, but they too Zoomed for the ceremony, which took place in Michelle's parents' backyard. Their wedding cake, that was from a local West Town bakery that typically does wholesale, but then it changed its model as well due to the coronavirus. Champagne, luminati's, and delicious cake. I just feel like... Yeah, I feel fortunate and in the tough times that is all over the world right now that we got to get married and it is going to be a memorable one. Now, they have already filed some of that immigration paperwork, but like so much else during the pandemic, they're not sure how long that will take or if that too will require a virtual meeting instead of a real life one. Now, the clerk says that she typically processes about 30,000 marriage certificates a year. Much of those, again, are on halt, except for in these situations, she says about 15 or 20 a week. Brandis, back to you. That's quite the reduction, Amanda, and congrats to Michelle and Prasad. Thank you. Very good. Still to come on Chicago tonight, how addiction treatment services are adjusting to COVID-19 using methods like online therapy. 
Cleaners on the front lines of COVID-19 demonstrate their vir virus killing tools. Restaurateur and chef Rick Bayless on the state of Illinois restaurants. And we visit a gallery filled with spiritual artwork. But first, we turn back to Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring tonight's show from the Pullman neighborhood on Chicago's far south side, Paris. Hey, Brandis, and I'm joined right now by 9th Ward Alderman Anthony Beal, whose ward covers a lot of Pullman and Roseland. Alderman, thanks for being here. My pleasure. So, in the shutdown, what keeps you up the most at night? Well, what keeps me up the most right now is the fact that uh, now I think we've exposed the fact that we have a health desert in our community. We know we had a food desert years ago, and we've been addressing the food desert with the Walmart and bringing fresh produce into the area. But now this pandemic has really exposed that we have a health desert in our community. And so we've been fighting tooth and nail to make sure we're able to keep things moving, uh, bring awareness to the area, and let everybody know that we have a wonderful hospital right here in our community with Roseland Hospital. And they've been on life support trying to keep that hospital open and afloat but they're doing a bang up job every single day, servicing, servicing people, and they need to get the recognition they're, they're due to make sure that we can keep that hospital afloat because if we lose that hospital in this community, you're talking about a travesty on the south side of Chicago. And, and we spoke with the hospital a little earlier. We're going to speak with them again, but there are a lot of pre-existing conditions with a lot of residents that they're dealing with. You know, we also met an unemployed resident who says he's been working for four months trying to get access to the state unemployment system, and he has no luck. Mm -hmm. What, what advice do you give them? Well, you have to keep trying. You know, the state is having problems with their website. You have to just keep uh, working on the website. Call your state rep. Call your state senator. They're still working. They're working from home, some of them. And so you have to make sure that you reach out to them, and maybe they can reach out to somebody to get you over that hump to make sure you can get that unemployment benefit. And when we met him, he seemed incredibly frustrated going in person to facilities, no luck at all. You know, you've had some momentum here with the new Walmart you mentioned and the Method Factory, new businesses coming in. Does this hurt your efforts at trying to develop Roseland and Pullman? Well, it's definitely hurt the momentum, um, but let me just say, we're going to pick the ball up and we're going to continue to move forward. We've been able to leverage 435 million in public-private partnerships. We've been able to create over 15, 1,600 jobs. Crime has been decreasing in the area. So we're excited about the direction that we're going, and so we just have to continue moving that ball forward. I'm excited, even though we're going through this pandemic, I guarantee you we're going to rebound and we're going to come back bigger, better, and stronger than we were before. There's a lot of optimism from folks that I talk to in the community. What about Mayor Lori Lightfoot? You know, a lot of aldermen have complained that um, she has too much power here to make decisions with that executive order that she passed. What do you think? Is she listening to aldermen? Well, you know, I voted against the executive order. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, too much power is not good for anyone. And, you know, we're, you know, the legislative branch and we're there for the checks and balances. And we're the ones that at the end of the day have to vote on these budgets. So why would we vote on a budget and then give total control over to the executive branch? I think when, when you lose those checks and balances, I think you're headed for, that's a recipe for disaster. And speaking of budgets, you know, the mayor has downplayed any budget shortfall that's going to result of all this loss in revenue. Are you as optimistic about the budget forecast as she's been? No, absolutely not. I said when we voted on this last year's budget that this was a budget of hope. We hope it balanced. We hope we get revenue. We hope we get revenue from the federal government. And that was before the coronavirus pandemic. So I knew that this budget was going to have holes in it from the very beginning. How big a hole you think this could oh, be? We're looking at over between two and three billion dollar deficit is what I believe that we're going to be looking at. And that's and, like about a fifth of the budget. Oh, absolutely. And that is only, you know, I projected 1.3 to 1.6 before the coronavirus hit the, the, um, the country. And so with that, now that we have this shortfall, it's going to be even bigger than that. And so to downplay it and to say that we were okay just a couple of weeks ago, our budget is okay, I think was extremely short-sighted. All right, Alderman Beal, we're going to have to watch for that. When a lot of the coronavirus coverage uh, winds down, there's going to be a lot of news stories to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll be back with the CEO of the Roseland Community Hospital and why he's so upset with public officials right now. A fifth, Paris. That's a massive piece of the of the budget, if, if that is the case. We'll, we'll see you in a bit. Thank you. Up next, treating drug and alcohol addiction while staying safe from the coronavirus. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. 
Alcohol and substance abuse are not taking a break during the pandemic, but neither is treatment for those addictions. Treatment groups say they've had to adjust their operations, whether moving treatment sessions online or handing out masks along with their naloxone supplies. Joining us with more on these adjustments are Lester Munson, a chairman of the board at Hazelden Betty Ford, a nationwide substance abuse rehabilitation nonprofit, and Brandy Wilson, the executive director at the Chicago Recovery Alliance, an organization focused on harm reduction to address the opioid epidemic. Thanks to you both for joining us. Lester, we see you quite a bit on the Week in Review, so it's good to have you talking about this, too. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Brandis. <laughs> so, Brandy, let's start with you. Um, how has the pandemic changed the operations for you all? It, uh, it had us, it really made us figure out how to pivot and quickly. Um, we are now seeing people sort of food truck style. So instead of them coming on our van and getting much more in depth interactions and support. Um, we're having to do things, <clears throat> sorry, um, really as though our truck is a food truck, um, you know, window service and um, getting things that people need, but also our deliveries have increased. And as other um, harm reduction programs may have had to scale back or whatever, um, we have, we have definitely not had a reduction in people that we're seeing, um, and we have had a greater ask for supplies. Lester, how about you all? How would you say the pandemic has changed operations? Almost as soon as the pandemic began, Brandis, we noticed that we lost 25% of our resident patients. We offer healing and hope in both inpatient and outpatient settings and what has happened is a number of the residential payment patients decided they would go home and come back after the pandemic. However, our outpatient is now at 100% uh, and growing almost by the day. So we've had a lot of patients coming in, uh, and, but we're down to 75% of our revenues. So we have had to make some changes in our operations a, f a very small number of furloughs, some salary percentage reductions, and other things. And right now, everything seems to be falling into place. Uh, we expect to come out even uh, when the pandemic finally comes to an end. And, and Lester, so for the people who are in the facilities, how are you managing making sure that they don't uh, have COVID-19? That is the question, uh, yes. We, uh, before we admit anybody into either inpatient or outpatient, they are examined, taking of temperature, checking of all symptoms. If anybody has any of the COVID-19 symptoms, they are sent away to a hospital or to a doctor. They can come back when they recover. And then all of the vendors, all of the people that are involved in our operation, every time they come onto one of our 17 campuses, their temperature is taken, they are examined. We now have a testing program that we are in partnership with the Mayo Clinic. We are able to do tests that get very quick results. So the combination of the thermometers and the tests and the vigilance has kept us away from COVID-19 on all 17 of our places. Brandy, you say that, you know, you're actually seeing an increase in the need. How are you also making sure that your staff who are interacting with the folks in need, that everyone is, is making sure that they are not passing the virus between themselves, if anyone should have it? Right. Um, so first, we split our team in half, and because many of half of our team are some of the folks that really came up through the HIV epidemic. So they are in more vulnerable um, groups. So we really divided our team in half and those folks are playing a big support role, making sure we have um, everything we need and done in sanitary ways. So because we can't have a lot of people at our warehouse um, making kits and doing all of the 
the things that it's taken us so much human power to make. Um, our staff that came off of outreach, they're making sure that we have all of those. And then myself included, the ones of us who are doing outreach, we have created policies along the guidance of um, CDC and IDPH. Um, we all wear masks. We, and Brandy, are you are you also providing um, what can you provide online? You know, if a lot of what you do involves, you know, distributing and training on naloxone uh, and suboxone, what are you able to do online? We can do most of that online. So we currently have um, biweekly overdose prevention train the trainer trainings. And so people can sign up for those and then they can be naloxone trainers in their community. We also are working with the city of Chicago for their homeless COVID shelters. We are, go we are weekly doing um, naloxone trainings for all folks living there. And we are doing the last naloxone distribution as well through those. Um, and and a lot of those. Sorry, sorry I just wanted to uh, get to is, cover as much as we can. Lester, how are you ensuring um, treatment and access? You said you've got a lot of folks who have gone home. Uh, how are you ensuring uh, that they can maintain their sobriety through the online communications that you have with them? We have moved from one on one counseling in person for all of our patients to online counseling. Uh, we were very concerned about it when we installed it. We had to finish installing it in a big hurry when the pandemic came along, but now it is working out very well. We've had only a few patients who did not have devices. We took care of that. And now the counseling and the group sessions are doing extremely well online. We also have a follow-up care. We follow the patients for six months, some of them up to a year. We have various online programs that were in existence before the pandemic that allow people to be in contact with us as well as attending their 12-step meetings in AA. Okay, and well, thank you so much. We'll unfortunately have to leave it there. There's a lot to talk about because uh, uh, there's a lot of work that you all are doing, I'm sure. Uh, my thanks to Lester Munson and Brandy Wilson. Thank you both for joining us on Chicago Tonight. Thank, thank you, you Brandy. One perhaps overlooked essential worker on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic is the professional cleaner. A local cleaning company gave us a demonstration of the tools in their arsenal for killing the virus. Test our equipment so it's working properly. What we do is janitorial cleaning. So if there's a restaurant, an office, um, a medical center that needs to be cleaned, we will go in there and do either day porter services, so cleaning during the day, um, or cleaning on the non-operational hours, which is at night. We have two different types of tiers. We have a confirmed and a non-confirmed. For our staff, we treat everything PPE-wise as a confirmed case. Better safe than sorry. But we've gone into locations that have definitely had confirmed COVID-19 cases as recent as like the person left an hour ago or the person hadn't been there for a week. So prior to entering, we've now had to tell the team, make sure you are fully suited. You've got all your gear on. When it comes to the spraying, the viricide spraying, the fogging, we require the P100 respirator. First thing you're gonna do is use a sprayer. Now the sprayer has a product, you spray that, dwell time of 10 minutes, come back, wipe it. That's done. Next, you're gonna use something driven by technology and science called the ESS machine. The ESS has charged particles behind it. And if nobody's gonna be there within four hours, then we'll use the fogger. The fogger just throws a light mist in the air and um, could cover more ground, but then you have it in the air. Once we've ensured that everything, those high touch points have been covered, we do that last walkthrough, we're done, give it the stamp of approval, and on to the next one. If you see personal items, you're still allowed to go ahead and spray them. People touch that too, everything that's touched. The first step is the spray. Second step, to clean it off. Third step, to spray it and leave it. 
three or four people at a time we're bringing in um, and training them on the new steps, the new processes and protocols on how to clean. You know, don't just wipe, you know, by the keyboard on the desk. You know, you gotta take everything out. You have to wipe everything down and making sure you are more thorough. The old style of cleaning is not something that we can do. We have to change with the times. Rosalado Services says they use EPA approved disinfectants and while spraying personal items like pens or cell phones is relatively safe, they do not spray the chemicals on or near food. Now we check back in with Paris Schutz in the Pullman neighborhood where he's joined by the head of a local community hospital on the front lines of fighting the pandemic. Paris, we've been hearing a lot about this hospital in the last few weeks. We have Brandis, and you just heard the alderman talk about how that hospital is really all this community has. So we're joined by CEO of Roseland Community Hospital, Tim Egan. Thanks for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be here. So recently, the state got a distribution of the drug remdesivir, about 140 cases of it. It could be a lifesaver for a lot of folks experiencing extreme symptoms. Roseland didn't get any. How come? Remdesivir is here in Illinois, but it's nowhere near the new Rosen Community Hospital. I guess we didn't qualify. And I just want to, I can't understand why that is. We have the sickest of the sick, and we have people dying. We have a 37% morbidity rate for those inpatients who are admitted for COVID-19. So you, you have the most vulnerable patients here that could benefit from remdesivir. The disparity here is unquestionable. All African Americans are dying at alarming rate. We're 7% of the population and 16% of the deaths here in Chicago. Remdesivir should be here at Rosen Community Hospital. Have you got, you know, it was Illinois Department of Public Health that was doing the distribution to hospitals. Have you talked to them and asked them why you so, didn't get any? Uh, as of even this morning, I've sent a email to Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton asking, how do we get in line for this remdesivir? Please talk to us. We've submitted applications to IDPH. We're in constant contact and asking for this drug. I mean, are you if you got remdesivir, could you save lives here? Absolutely. So people, people are, will die if you don't get this. People are dying at alarming rate, but people, we are, there are miracles that are happening every day within the walls at the new Rosen Hospital. We are saving lives. With remdesivir, we can save more lives. And, you know, you talked about, um, you know, the financial troubles at the hospital. Illinois just got about six to seven hundred million dollars from HHS four hospitals did you get some of that so there is a medicaid uh, amount of money that came in in the hundreds of millions of dollars that went to hospitals that had up to 100 inpatient uh, for covid by april 10th we didn't qualify for that so these formulas that the government is coming up may not be racist in the beginning but they sure are having racist effects and and affecting these communities like the new roles and community hospitals. take us in roseland right now you know uh, we spoke with one of your doctors that said in the very beginning it was packed because people were experiencing so many symptoms what's going on in there right now well there is bright hope amongst the dark chaos i can assure you that because we're working hard we are saving lives but we've got gurneys up against desks we've got people that are overwhelming our emergency department we're doing the best we can and I can't commend our staff enough for the hard work they've been giving over this time. How are you affording all this service? I mean, are you, are you, if you're not getting the Medicaid reimbursement, how does the hospital pay We're for it? We're falling deeper in debt. And the sadness here is that I'm not asking for a casino to be built to give me revenue. I'm not asking for more miracle, medical marijuana to be sold to give me revenue. That Medicaid money is in this state right now, but it's been redirected to higher, uh, lower Medicaid hospitals and hot, and I'm sorry for skipping here, but it just incenses me to the point where these billion dollar corporations are getting more Medicaid money and we're losing Medicaid money here at Roseland. I mean, can you give me a sense of, of what the debt the hospital's carrying right now uh, is? We're well over $10 million now because of the COVID. We've had to invest in more staff. We had to invest in more equipment. We've had to make physical changes to the hospital itself. And that's dr driving us deeper in debt. What is your way out of that? What is our way out? the redistribution of that Medicaid money. You know, we survived by this hospital tax assessment that had been traditionally a Robin Hood tax. And in 2018, it got redirected into the Sheriff of Nottingham tax. Rolls and Community Hospital lost $7 million in 2018, while big billion dollar corporations got 24 million, $34 million. And that right now you're seeing this COVID CARES Act money come into Illinois. It's going right back to those same institutions while Rolls and Hospital keeps getting shortchanged. Clearly, it's a, it's a very emotional situation right now. Tim Egan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right, Brandis, we'll be back from Pullman to wrap it up in just a bit, but now we toss it back to you. 37% mortality rate, Paris. Wow. Okay, thank you. Up next, Chef Rick Bayless is cooking up ways to support restaurants during the pandemic. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. 
Rick Bayless is a familiar face to many Chicagoans thanks to his PBS program Mexico one plate at a time and his food is familiar taste to many Chicagoans as well thanks to his multiple restaurants here. But even formerly flourishing restaurants like his are finding themselves in dire straits as the weeks of the government's shutdown stretch into months. And with no promise of an end in sight, Bayless and other Illinois restaurateurs are questioning whether Governor J.B. Pritzker's plan leaves enough room at the table for their industry to survive. Chef Rick Bayless joins us now from his test kitchen to talk about the state and the fate of Illinois restaurants. Chef, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Brandis. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Now, you've been a prominent member of the Independent Restaurant Coalition that's lobbying to get government assistance for struggling restaurants and their workers. What are you hoping federal, state, local governments can do to support the restaurant industry? Well, for number one, we are very thankful to our governor for all of his leadership. Um, but we are most concerned with the, cell, uh, the safety and health of both our employees and also of our guests. So we are working very hard to develop the right protocols to make sure that we are keeping everybody safe. But what we are most concerned about right at this very minute is this 28 day window that our governor has said for each one of his stages. And at the present time, no restaurants are gonna be able to open up until the end of June. And I just don't know how many restaurants are still gonna be around at the end of June, because in spite of the fact that we can do a little bit of takeout and delivery business, we're certainly not making anywhere near the money that we were making before. And we're still racking up all of the bills that we have. The fixed costs of the restaurant business are really high. So we're asking our local government, we're asking our governor to take a look at that and see, and we don't even know at the end of, of June, what percentage of our dining rooms will be able to fill. Um, I will say that independent restaurants work on very, very slim margins. And I can tell you every single restaurateur that I know is racking up a lot of debt. At some point, all of these restaurateurs will just say, I'm sorry, I'm out. I can't keep on racking up debt. We are very concerned about the health and safety of both our employees and our guests, as I said, but at the same time, we need restaurants to survive. On the national level, what we're looking for through the Independent Restaurant Coalition is a restaurant, uh, a restaurant uh, uh, a stabilization fund. I got the right word here now. The Restaurant Stabilization Fund. And we have Earl Blumenauer from Oregon championing our cause and working with us to develop a bill that we are going to ask the legislators to pass so that we can get a little bit of stabilization going for restaurants, independent restaurants primarily, not chain restaurants, not ones that have access to a whole lot of, um, and Chef, of different uh, sources. Yeah, and I want to come back to sort of reopening plans in a bit as well, but you've uh, made yes. some efforts to help the restaurant industry yourself. Um, tell us about your partnership with U.S. Foods um, and how you're helping laid off restaurant workers. Well, when we were forced to close and I had to lay off 250 employees, it was the saddest day of my life, and uh, we got in contact through this training program that we do on the west side of Chicago with U.S. Food Service, and they said that they had a lot of, of, of uh, food that was just going to go bad. And so we said, well, if you bring it to our restaurant, we'll pack boxes and we'll give it to our staff, restaurants, uh, staff around us, because I know that most restaurant staff, um, they don't have big savings accounts and they, can, they can't say, oh, I can weather the storm for the next three months here. And so we started together with US Food Service and also one of the uh, a local, uh, a local anonymous donor um, to start packing boxes. And we every week do 1200 boxes that will supply 12, each box will supply about 12 meals for uh, a, a laid off 
a restaurant worker's family. And um, so we have been very successful in getting food to people also, who are the most hired, needy. You've also hired laid off workers um, to do some we of that have. work. Um, but in recent weeks, the country's food supply chain has shown, of course, a great deal of fragility, particularly meat packing plants. And your Frontera yes. Farmer Foundation supports Midwest family farms. How important are those smaller farms? Well, the truth of the matter is in a restaurant, um, for every dollar you spend, 95 uh, cents of that dollar goes out into our network of the people that we're either hiring or that are supplying us. And we work very strongly with local sources, local farms, because because we know that they not only supply um, jobs in our community and support an economy here, but they also give us the freshest and the best stuff, the kind of stuff that you would buy at a farmer's market. So the Frontera Farmer Foundation gives capital improvement grants every year, and we just gave away the ones for 2020. We gave away $215,000 uh, to 21 local farms and uh, over the years that we've been doing this, we have given away $2.5 million just to help them get hoop houses and delivery vehicles and, and watering systems so and that course, they can become more productive yeah. and more profitable. And during this time, you know, a lot of people are, are cooking at home. Maybe some people are experimenting a little bit more. Where yes. can we find some of your recipes that we can try out at home until we can get back into the restaurants? Uh, <laughs> yes, I've been doing a whole lot of these uh, quarantine videos. I did 30 in a row. Um, uh, like half hour classes where I cook a dish and I show you from beginning to end, no prep ahead or anything like that, how to put something unique and delicious on your table. You can go to my YouTube channel, um, that's at Rick Bayless, and, um, or you can go through rickbayless.com, my website, and you can find them there under the television things. But yes, I'm trying to help people to utilize the ingredients that they have on hand or that they can easily find at a grocery store to do some Excellent. delicious and interesting dinners. All right. All right, and that's where we'll see you on uh, online there, Chef. Chef Rick yes, Bayless, thanks absolutely. so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Nice to be with you. Chicago Tonight got a private tour of a collection of artistic treasures with a spiritual focus. Our latest virtual visit is a look at artwork designed to inspire. Arts producer Mark Vitale has the story. There is artwork from Russia, and a painting from Peru blends Christian beliefs with Incan motifs. But European works are the foundation of the Darcy Collection, a treasure of medieval, Renaissance, and Baroque art. This assemblage of art occupies three galleries at LUMA, the Loyola University Museum of Art on Michigan Avenue. So we're definitely focused on art illuminating the spirit, and I think that comes through our name, LUMA. We want to provide a space for artistic expression that illuminates the experiences of humanity and the spirit. Something that comes up a lot when I talk to my colleagues at Loyola is that art has the power to transform society. And I think a lot of that is connected to the spirit. There is an abundance of three-dimensional work, sculpture and religious objects. The collection was founded in 1969 by a Loyola priest, Father Donald Rowe. Once it started to, to get more popular and the word got out through the curator and the university themselves have had donations and acquired more pieces to supplement the collection. It also includes secular works that celebrate family milestones such as weddings and births. It's beyond seeing a, a painting or a sculpture of Jesus Christ. It's also about the way of life that people were living at the time and how their lives were kind of uh, greatly integrated with their spirituality, something that we may not see as often today, but is still quite relevant. Also on view, the struggle for spirituality. Here, the prophet Job fights his demons. This 500-year-old crucifixion scene from the Netherlands paints a grim picture of the horrors of execution. This curious elephant clock represents Christ trampling the devil. It was recently on loan to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. We have a lot of people that come through for a specific event called the Visio Divina. That means sacred seeing. Where students from the theology department come through and sit with the art and kind of have a meditative experience. And I think, especially during a time in the pandemic, it's just a time to be quiet and reflect 
on the human experience and society's experience. Even if somebody grows up differently or has a different religion, we're all connected by the idea of answering to a higher power, whatever it may be, and how it kind of grounds us. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And when the Darcy Collection at Luma reopens to visitors, it will be by appointment only. You can see more of it on our website. And this Thursday, we'll pay a virtual visit to the DeSable Museum of African American History. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com news. And you can also get the show via podcast in the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. That's right. As local transit agencies await stimulus funding, looking at how they're keeping buses and trains rolling. And a look at Governor Pritzker's pandemic response. Our Spotlight Politics team weighs in on that and more. And we leave you tonight with some of this morning's Blue Angels flyover. The squadron has been performing across the country to honor essential workers. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, proud to be named in the 2020 edition of the Best Lawyers in America.